This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. Hello everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the TV Podcast. I am Dustin, EJ, and Scatter joining me today, and today we have... Kind of a news roundup episode. Uh, we've got some different things that have popped up. Nothing that would be warranting an entire 30-minute discussion, so we figured we would incorporate all of those. But I'm sure, as you probably have noticed from the title of the episode, uh, we will be talking about bat nipples today. Um, and not the ones that uh, fly in the sky. Let's just put it that way. Um yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that later. That's going to be our uh, our last topic. But we do have some new stuff that came out over the last week. That some of this stuff actually came out over the past two weeks, but because of our special episode that we had last week, um, we didn't have any discussions related to news. So we're going to talk about some news topics from the last couple weeks, and then we'll get into talking about some bat nipples. All right. So the first thing we want to talk about is there was a new video release from Gotham Knights. Specifically, it's focusing on Nightwing. And this, to a degree, it's showing some of the same game mechanics that we've previously seen in that other teaser video that we already had talked about here on the podcast. But there's a lot more here. Um, I think the best thing to focus on is the move set is very acrobatic, as we have already po- as we pointed out before. Um, he doesn't kick anybody off the side of a building this time around, so that's that's a plus. Um, but overall, there's a lot going on in this video, just showing off his move sets and different things like that. Of course, you you've got the um, almost necess- uh, necessary show of that crazy thing that he's going to be gliding around on, the Nightwing glider thing that is going to show up in the game. Um, what did you guys think of the video? I liked it overall. I really don't have too much like more to say based on it. I think the thing that stood out to me the most was his voice. Um, it's more... Uh, I guess youthful than I would have anticipated. So I didn't, it's not that I disliked it or anything. I actually, I liked it, but it threw me off for a second. Cause I think like the way the character is designed, he looks like a brick, you know? And so like the voice that comes out of him, like, Oh, okay. So that's Nightwing. So, but other than that, like, you know, it looks like a game. I still, you know, I really want to play. I'm going to have to upgrade my console, but I do want to play it. It looks fun. And, you know, the acrobatic maneuvers and everything are, you know, what I guess you would expect from Nightwing. You know, it feel he feels like he would play how you would want him to play. Yeah, the thing I noticed about the video was um, it shows a couple different um, costumes that he's wearing. One, he's got kind of uh, like a, almost like a shaved head. And one, he's got like, um, looks like a punk rocker kind of. It's like not the normal... Uh, Nightwing costume that we're used to seeing, and I hope that for all the characters in the game that you can download like a more traditional comic book uh, costume. Yeah, it'll be nice to see a lot of different costumes. Um, the one thing that my son to this day goes back and does with Arkham Knight is he goes and he plays just, you know, randomly on, I mean, we beat the game, but he will randomly start playing and he'll put different bat suits on the different skins and that's always a really cool feature um and it's also obviously for the developer a lot of uh, easy way for them to make extra money by releasing a bunch of extra skins that 
people will really want to have their character in. So could we see a, you know, a George Perez uh, Nightwing? That could be interesting. Um, there's a lot of a lot of creators, unfortunately, recently that have passed um, or aren't doing so well in general that uh, could have their art in some way, you know, brought to life in video game form. And that would be kind of cool to see. You know how they did used to do on 64 for uh, GoldenEye, they had DK mode where everyone's head was really big. Yeah. They should do that for <laughs> Nightwing's butt, I think. <laughs> All right. So some more Batman Universe news. Um, there is some news on the front of Joker, uh, the Joker sequel, that is. Um, specifically, we knew this was happening to a degree because Todd Phillips, the director of the original film, um, he had gone on to say that he was going, you know, he was interested in coming up with an idea for a season two. Now, whether or not, or not season two, a, a sequel to the film. And he didn't explicitly say for sure it was happening or anything like that. But just recently, we've had a lot of stuff happen. Um, that basically brings it to light that it is, in fact, something that is real. Um, so, first off, um, it was announced that uh, he, Phillips, Todd Phillips revealed on social media the title of the new project is Joker Folia Du, um, which is referencing a medical term for an identical or similar mental disorder that affects two or more individuals, usually members of the same family. Um, now he also incorporate he also included a picture of Joaquin Phoenix reading the script, um, and while we 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 would assume based off of that picture that they are at least in talks for him to reprise his role as Arthur Fleck, uh, whether or not that happens we'll see. Um, but the other big details is that supposedly Lady Gaga is in early talks to star opposite of Phoenix in the sequel, um, and there's not something specific saying that she will or won't play Harley Quinn, but that is the assumption that I think the media is taking based off of the idea that they are getting somebody to come in. Now, there's some other rumor going around, and I... Well, let's talk about the Lady Gaga thing first, because we'll talk about the other part, the other rumor that's floating around out there in a second, but uh, Lady Gaga is Harley Quinn in this Jokerverse. Thoughts? I could see her doing it, and it would be a different take, and it would probably be very interesting. I think the hard sell for me is I don't think Todd Phillips is a very interesting director. And so, like, unless they do some, like, major shakeups, like, I don't know. I am I don't know if I'm going to be there, like, opening night, but, you know, the, the Lady Gaga thing, like, I could just see her doing it well. I think um, this movie getting a sequel is bound to happen just because of how much money it made. Like, made such a, like a, a boatload of money. So, I think when you cast someone, if you're going to get someone as big a name as Lady Gaga <clears throat> to play opposite of our Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, it's definitely going to be Harley Quinn. I don't think they're going to have some other and they'll pull there. And Todd Phillips, this guy went from directing Old School and The Hangover, and now he's got the keys to a comic book franchise is kind of insane and interesting there was some rumors back this isn't about the film we'll talk about the other rumor in a second but there was some rumors that uh the new warner media or warner discovery uh warner brothers discovery ceo uh, david zaslov uh had is at least um close with Todd Phillips to a degree. Not necessarily that Todd Phillips is, you know, his best friend or anything like that, but I remember seeing a couple of different things saying that Todd Phillips uh, was being consulted on the direction of what to do with DC. Not like he's going to be the new Zack Snyder for it or anything like that, but more of a they saw the success of Joker and they want to rep uh, you know, they want to replicate that in different ways with other characters and they were discussing how to go about potentially doing that. Um, and I know Phillips was involved in at least in some degree with those conversations. Um, no word on what will actually happen. I'm hoping here soon we're going to be getting some sort of thing. I know sometimes when a merger happens, things take a, a you know, a second to happen, but we don't exactly have a, you know, an upcoming slate of films. We've got, 
this Joker 2, we've got, you know, the Batman 2, and there's the current slate that was already well in production before all of this with Black Adam and Shazam 2, Flash, and Aquaman. But outside of that, we have Batgirl and Blue Beetle, and that's it. We don't ha- have anything else yet. And that's kind of worrisome because, you know, you can't go very long without having some sort of plan. There was talk about a Wonder Wo- or Wonder Twins film. You know, Wonder Woman 3 will eventually happen. But for the most part, there's not a lot of projects that are actually out. And the amount of projects that they're going to be putting out this year into next year, there's not a lot of room for an opportunity to kind of just like wait to see what's going to happen. They have really do have to come up with a plan shortly in order to move forward and keep the franchise, you know, in the, in the, 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 the viewpoint of the public. I, I kind of wonder what the conversations were like or what, you know, they talked about. Cause I hope it was a little more than like, well, watch some movies you really liked and maybe we'll do some riffs on that. But <laughs> You never know. That could be like a genius level idea where they just take things they enjoy and repackage them with DC characters. Yeah. Now, the other rumor that stemmed from potentially Lady Gaga being involved in Joker 2 is that this could be a musical. And I don't think this is at all true or a possibility. I don't even know where this really came from other than the involvement from Lady Gaga. Obviously, Lady Gaga was involved in a film, uh, Star is Born, that was like really her first big film that she was in, which happened to come from Warner Brothers, but the film itself, um, it did well um, for what it was. I wouldn't necessarily classify it as a musical. I mean, there were songs and things in it, but I don't know that it would classify as a musical. I think that bringing her on board immediately has people like, oh, well, why would you bring in somebody who's known to be a, you know, a big singer? Unless you were going to do something musical-wise. I don't think that's the case at all. Quite honestly, I don't feel like they would be making anything whatsoever related to a musical. I, I feel like that would be kind of crazy, but I, I also wouldn't say it's impossible. I think that would be interesting. And, like, you know how you're, you're talking about, like, you know, what you feel is or isn't a musical. I mean, when you look at movies that are classified as musicals, you have ones where almost every line of dialogue is like sung, but then you have other ones where you have maybe only five ish songs in the movie that just help push the plot along. And that's it, you know, like mileage can vary. So, but the idea that, you know, maybe this was a Joker movie where there is some kind of singing element, you know, that could create some kind of like Fantasia that shows you what's going on in their minds. Like to me, that's actually kind of interesting. I'm sure there'll be one big um, musical number where they go back to those stairs that he uh, danced on in the first uh, one. They'll do some big singing act. I don't think it'll be like Grease or anything where every few minutes they're singing about what's going on, but I'm sure there'll be one big song. It'll be get a billion downloads. It'll steal the internet for a few days and then we'll move on. All right, so that's Joker 2. Moving on to some non-Batman Universe news, but definitely some DC Universe news. The first trailer for Black Adam, which is coming out in October, released. And I wanted to get our thoughts on the trailer. Obviously, it's outside the realm of the Batman Universe, but we know that the DC Universe is still something that we enjoy covering. Um, Not to, obviously, the degree of the Batman Universe, but it's still cool to see other DC properties making their way to the big screen. So this is the first trailer. Uh, Black Adam has been a project that has literally been in development since 2014, when The Rock first announced that he was... You know, entering the DC universe and going to be playing a role, and it was learned that it was Black Adam. Um, there's this tagline that is kind of interesting, and I before before we talk about the trailer itself, there's a tagline that says like the balance for power is shifting or something like that, and I think that there's this idea possibly of setting it up to have Black Adam play a much larger role than just a villain. Um, Obviously, in the film, in the trailer, we see not only is he this character who is a, you know, a threat, 
but also a force to be reckoned with. And then the Justice Society kind of approaches him as a way to try to bring him on board and say, like, listen, use your powers for good kind of situation. I'm sure that's going to be seen in some way in the film, but there was a point in time where I think a lot of people were assuming that we could eventually see like a Black Adam Superman mashup or them face off to some degree just because of some hints that were happening outside of the films. And recently, DC Comics, this isn't something that's just happened, but this has been happening for a little bit of time where Black Adam is kind of been taking the less of a role of a villain and more of like an anti-hero and i wonder if that was purposefully done in the comics to kind of make way for this possibility of black adam being something different for the films what do you guys think that's interesting and i've noticed that too you know in my head i kind of equated it to like how marvel treats namer um you know and and starting off as the villain and then he's like some kinds of sometimes like a frenemy or an anti-hero or whatever they really need him to be sometimes he goes back to villain you know and i do feel like that makes for a compelling character and especially if you're making him like his own standalone well i guess he wouldn't be standing alone in this movie but he is like top billing for the movie you know and i think the thing i'm most excited for about the movie actually is um, the JSA. Like, I'm really excited to see the JSA in action, in a live action, big screen, you know, vehicle, you know, because that's something I've always loved, you know, JSA stories. So I'm really looking forward to it. If Black Adam's the guy that, like, brings them out into the mainstream, that's cool with me. Yeah, it's funny that I thought about the same thing how ever since The Rock got attached to this, all of a sudden, Black Adam's been more of a been in the forefront uh, as a hero like he's in the justice league now recently and so um yeah it feels like he's been attached to this project forever and then when it first when the rumors first came out i was like that doesn't make sense the rock likes to be the hero he likes to be he's the face to use a wrestling term and then i was like black adam's a bad guy he fights shazam he does all these things but now he even says it's weird in the trailer where he says that like hawkman says like heroes don't kill people and black rock comes up to him and says what I do, which is kind of was shocking to me to see that. And I'm right there with you, Scott. I'm very pumped for the Justice Society. I'm pumped for Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate. I think uh, that might steal the show. I, I like the guy who plays Hawkman. Excited to see him on the screen. So I think the whole trailer looks pretty badass. I'm kind of excited for the movie. Yeah, the trailer looks amazing. Um, I don't know that I'm, like, drawn in on sheer plot because I don't think they, they, they did a great job of establishing what the plot is in the first trailer, but that's not always the point of the first trailer. The first trailer is just to, you know, garner some interest from people who wouldn't otherwise be interested. And I think for that, it does a good job of doing that. I think that, um, when it comes to this trailer, you can tell it's going to be some sort of origin story for black Adam. And then you can tell that the just justice society is going to be introduced um, there's a lot of characters involved that I think when people thought about the potential of a Black Adam film, I don't think they were even thinking about some of these other characters being involved. Um, so it should be really interesting to see what ends up happening with this film. I'm, I'm concerned on... Uh, concerned probably isn't the right word. I, I'm... I'm interested to see what happens you know like is there a larger plan here for black adam and the justice society or is the plan just make a really good film and then that's it because my my problem that i have with a lot of the dc stuff in general recently is that it feels like their plan is make a good movie and that's fine but you can't compete with marvel if all you're ever doing is just making a singular great movie and that's it. And, you know, like, I I enjoyed The Suicide Squad last year for what it was, but you could tell that it was kind of a sequel, but just because of some of the characters carrying over. But that was it. And Peacemaker was a great follow-up series to it, um, but I don't think that they made the Suicide Squad with the intent of, hey, we're going to do the Peacemaker series. It was more of a, the film was done, they offered James Gunn, you know, a TV series, and that's what he ended up doing. And it turned out well, but I I just have this, like, strange, 
I don't know, like a feeling in the pit of my stomach that literally it's just like a one and done and they're just waiting to see because they don't want to put all of their chips in a basket. They don't want to sit there and, you know, plan too much and set too many things up because they've been burned so many times over the past five, ten years. Yeah, it's, it seems like their plan is to put the movie out there, see how the world reacts to it, and then change it. If, if the, it's negative reaction, they'll change it slightly to do something else. They won't just stick with one singular focus. Yeah, and like with that's annoying. Trailer, yeah, that's yeah, it's how they screw themselves with Justice League and all that, yeah. and Joss Whedon and everything, and Zack Snyder. But with this trailer, like we get no, maybe there will be in the movie, but we get no hint of um, the wizard Shazam who... There's Black Adam the powers, we get no hint of Shazam as a character. So you think that Black Adam and then the Shazam movies coming out later next year, I think. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I think it's around Christmas this year. I think it was yeah. bumped up. You would have to think that at some point that those two have to meet. Like, they're that's Batman and the Joker right there, the yeah. Shazam and Black Adam. I do wonder if it's, you know, like you said, like they are testing the waters, but I wonder if it, the logic is. If they can't sell this movie, they're going to kind of kick it to the side and act like it didn't happen. But, you know, they're just seeing what audience engagement is before they go ahead and, like, toss him in Shazam 3 or something, you know, as the big bad. You know, like, it's just... It's still, even if the movie's bad, it's still going to make a ton just because of The Rock. Like, it's like he's, a, never, he's always in blockbusters. But, like, his ego, too, you know, like, it's he a, does not... He's not normally, like, a villain guy, you know, as you guys yeah. pointed out earlier... You know, and and maybe they are just testing this as like a reverse Scorpion King situation where, you know, at first that character was a villain and then he got his own movie as like, you know, the the protagonist. But who knows? I do. I do wonder, though, like just, you know, because like, as you said, like that's Shazam's number one enemy, you know, like that's like it it always goes back to (laughs) Black Adam. But yeah. You know, this this could just be like a test in the water, and hey, nobody liked it, so we're just gonna move ahead with something else for Shazam three. I mean, it's odd because in my mind, I think that uh, the villain that was in Shazam one makes perfect sense for like the origin story, just because there's no other reason. You don't need to have Black Adam be the like that might be the Joker to Shazam. But you don't need to have that as the the immediate villain up front and then immediately, you know, play your best card right away. I think that they did that well because it sets it up. Now it's established. Shazam 2, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know enough about Shazam to sit here and say I know who the villains are. I know it's Helen Mirren and uh, Lucy Liu are playing the villains in the, in the second film. And I remember there was word... When the before the first film came out, that the intent was that the, if I remember correctly, and I, I could be wrong, but if I remember correctly, it was supposed to be Shazam, Shazam Two, Black Adam was supposed to be setting up just Black Adam's origin, all of that, and then it would lead into Shazam Three for Black Adam and Shazam facing off. Now, if they go the route of having Shazam as the antihero, there's not a whole lot. That, at least in the immediate future, there is not a possibility of really having Shazam be coming or Shazam three coming out anytime soon because which also throws a hiccup because Shazam obviously is going to run the issue with like Stranger Things, which is they've got all these kids that need to you know stay the same age and obviously they're not going to they're going to keep growing and they're going to keep getting older and they're not going to look like children anymore for you know the the purpose of the film so that that presents its own problem um but also there's limitations because let's say black adam is super successful does that mean that they do another black adam film before shazam 3 to kind of set up this idea of him being a villain again or do they decide to go a different route and have Shaz- you know black adam become part of another story or another film or something like that where it's not his film but he's one of the main characters in the film or something like that because I can't imagine this being the only version of the Justice Society that we're going to see. I feel like we're going to see it here and it's going to be something that carries over even if there is you know, some sort of time gap and I don't think there is because based off of what we've seen it doesn't seem like there's this is taking place back in like 
the 1930s or 40s. It seems like it's taking place right now. So I wonder if it's just going to end with him a vil- as a villain. They're going to got to kind of do like an X Men first class situation where everyone knows like Magneto's the villain, but you know for most of the movie we see him as you know a partner and a friend to Xavier, and they tell that story. So maybe that's just you know the route all along because it would be different than like every other superhero movie they have coming out. You know you would do the reverse hero story where you know. Yeah, he kills and everything, but he's a reluctant ally until they have to cross paths at the end, and the JSA has to like lock him away or something. Yeah, he's a hero to his people or whatever, but he's a villain to like the rest of them. Yeah. Which I mean, I isn't that Geoforce too? I mean, no, I, I that's a that's a hard cut when it comes to uh, something possibly ended up in any sort of movie, but. It's the exact same kind of thing with uh, Geoforce. He's a you know great king to his people, but basically a murderer to the rest of the world. So, yeah. um, all right. So that's Black Adam. Um, Black Adam's hitting theaters in October. Um, we will definitely be talking about it once it comes out. Because let's be honest, we don't have any other Batman Universe films coming out anytime in the near future to discuss. So we have that. All right. Let's get into our our uh, main topic tonight uh which is bat nipples um so interestingly there was two and there i i tell you this was not necessarily pre-planned in any way in the sense of i did not think about different topics that we could discuss in the month of june and bat nipples came up as one of the topics that was not it at all uh what actually happened was there was two articles that happened within like days of each other and they both had the word bat nipple in the title and i was like huh what a weird random thing so those for those of you who don't know uh batman forever when it came out um back in 1995 there were bat nipples there were nipples on the bat suit and at the time it was odd it was an odd choice but it just kind of went and worked uh, skip forward to the uh, Batman and Robin in 1997, and we have um, there was some weird shots in the film where they were like accentuating the fact that they had you know that they were when they put on these suits their butts were molded pretty well and uh, all kinds of other weird shots of them just putting on the costumes. So, needless to say, um, that was a point of contention for a lot of people. Um, regardless the re- of the reasons behind it, um, whether you know Joel Schumacher was trying to, you know, accentuate things for one purpose or another, I don't know that it really makes that big of a difference. I think the big thing is that the costume designer who came up with it, his name is Jose Fernandez, and he was the one who came up with the idea for the nipples on the bat suit. Now, this was a departure from the Michael Keaton bat suit, which did not have bat nipples. But in a conversation with Mel Magazine, uh, Jose Fernandez opened up about the suit and said, With Val Kilmer's suit in Batman Forever, the nipples were one of those things that I added. It wasn't fetish to me. It was more informed by Roman armor, like Centurions. And in the comic books, the characters always look like they were naked with spray paint on them. It was all about anatomy. And I like to push anatomy. Uh, I don't know where exactly where my I don't know exactly where my head was at back in the day, but that's what I remember. So I added the nipples. I had no idea there was going to it was going to end up being all this buzz about it. Um, but Joel Schumacher famously has stated in the past, uh, I think this was on some of the special features for the films that he. He loved the the nipples on the bad suit. He said, uh, "Let's showcase them." Um, he wanted um, them to be <laughs> more pointy, and uh, that that just, just wasn't going to fly at, at uh, to a degree. I mean, obviously they were able to get nipples on the bad suit, but they weren't going to have pointy nipples on the bad suit. So that was uh, an interesting. I, I see this, but I swear at some point. Schumacher has also said in the past that the point of the nipples was it was like statues of Roman gods. I'm pretty sure he has said the exact same thing in the past. So this wasn't like, you know, 
groundbreaking news that has never been known before because it's certainly something that we have heard in the past. Um, but it's interesting because it comes specifically from the actual um, designer of the costume rather than somebody who had nothing to do with the design of the costume just is defending it because, of course, it was his project, and that would be Joel Schumacher. So I guess let's start off with thoughts about bat nipples in general. Pro or are are you for or against them? I mean, I'm against them, but, like, the explanation makes sense, I guess, and I feel like... It's just we're going to constantly keep hearing about it because the internet keeps relitigating, like the decision. And I honestly feel like they were worse than Batman and Robin. But <laughs> the Forever ones aren't as like if we're just talking about Forever, I don't really care. If we're going to talk about Batman for Batman and Robin, I'm staunchly in the no camp. I'm a big no um, on all uh, bat nipples. Um, what a time the uh, mid nine mid to late nineties were where they could just kind of do this to a comic book movie and throw it out there. And it really never, it really didn't get as much like heat as it should have, as it could have been back then. But I guess maybe it did, but there was no internet or anything. So it was just what a lawless time, uh, nineties comic book movies were. I almost kind of miss it in a sense, but I don't because then we get movies like Batman and Robin. You're, you're missing one part though. There were, if they got rid of the nipples in Batman forever, it wouldn't, there's like one line that wouldn't make sense, like when Batman meets um, Chase Meridian and Commissioner Gordon on the rooftop in the beginning of the movie, and Chase Meridian goes, "Sweet nips," <laughs> would not make sense without those on the suit. It's weird too. Um, when the Batman sixty six uh, Blu ray uh, that whole series came out, I was watching one of the episodes and just popped in my mind. It must have been. Because back then, Adam West was wearing like a T-shirt, like a really tight T-shirt, and it must have been a Mister Freeze episode or something. But <laughs> you can actually you can actually see like his nipples poking through, and it made me think like, oh, I wonder if there was some stupid Easter egg connection or. But that's just the thing that's odd to me, and I know this this could be taken the wrong way. I, I'm well aware of that before I say this, but. And Batman and Robin, you know, Bat, uh, Batman and Robin both have nipples, but Batgirl doesn't. And it's clear that the reason why that happens is because there is a specific standard that someone was saying, wait, 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 we can't do this on the female character, but we can definitely do this on the male character. And like, you know, equality for all is all I have to say. I mean, equality for all. But... uh <laughs> They gave her cones, though. <laughs> yeah, and they were cones, that's for sure. Um, now, interestingly, um, the um, the original interview that was on Mel Magazine, it started making the rounds, but around the exact same time, there was an article that popped up on Empire that was titled, Tim Burton on Batman Forever Nipple Suit. And he said, go F yourself. And it, it's it, he was talking uh, to Empire specifically to revisit the 30th anniversary of Batman Returns, which was this past week, uh, for those of you who didn't know. Um, and we might be doing something for Batman Returns here in the very near future, but Batman Returns isn't the only thing with a 30-year 30, 30 anniversary this year. There's uh, Batman the Animated Series as well, so we've got a bunch of different stuff. But in celebration of the 30th anniversary of Batman Returns, Tim Burton was talking to Empire about uh, Batman Returns, and he specifically was talking about um, looking back on the movie and th- how it, at the time, was deemed very dark. And then, obviously, this year we have a film like The Batman, which is almost, in, to a degree, darker depths than Batman Returns, but not... Not in the same way. Like, there's no horror elements of a character spitting up black stuff all over the place, or you know, biting body parts off of uh, other other people and things like that. Um, but that said, th- there was a there was a point that was made about um, the the nipples, and he he specifically was said. Uh, back then, they went the other way, uh, the f- uh, speaking specifically about the Schumacher films. And then he said, that's the funny thing about it. But then I was like, wait a minute. Okay, hold on a second here. You complained about me. I'm too weird. I'm too dark. But then you put nipples 
on the bat suit. And um, he he said, go after yourself seriously. So, yeah, I think that that's why I didn't end up doing the third film. Not because of the nipples necessarily, but he was just pointing out the fallacy of saying you went from one version of a character which you thought was too dark and too not family friendly to a degree. Because let's be honest, we know why everyone says it's dark. It's not necessarily because the film itself is dark. It's more because the film was marketed as a film for families and children. And it's not really at all a fan, a, a film that should be a, a you know, a, a film meant for children. So that was part of it. But then obviously they go in the different direction of having Joel Schumacher and he did make the films more family friendly, but then there are some questionable things like nipples on a bat suit or, the fact that we have those weird shots of them getting into their bat suits and you know showing their butts and things like that it doesn't make a lot of sense but you know i guess overall warner brothers doesn't exactly have a great great reputation of having they get like one good film and then they kind of let the create that let the director do something that they really want to do and it could go end up going too far and it tends to go sometimes too far doesn't always work out sometimes you know not everything can be a batman begins film which clearly to a degree was studio you know overseen by the studio where they were trying to make sure of certain things but then you get the dark knight which is a great film uh which you could see nolan had a little bit more leeway and then he obviously had even more leeway when it came to the dark knight rises and as the studio you just kind of hope that what they're going to do is great you know i really enjoyed the Batman and I look forward to seeing what Matt Reeves has, but you know, I can't imagine Matt Reeves going the route of, you know, like Tim Burton did where he went crazy dark with this sequel or, you know, going the route of Joel Schumacher from a, you know, not, not so like, honestly, when you look at Batman forever, there's some crazy elements when it comes to like some of the neon lights and things like that. But for the most part, that was a, that was, you know, born in, in the nineties. So that's why it works and what it is, what, or why it is what it is. But when it comes to, you know, Batman and Robin, that went like full camp and you could tell that that's what Joel Schumacher wanted to do. And be, you know, Batman forever was successful. So he was able to do what he wanted to do. And I think that's the problem when it comes to, you know, giving some creators a little bit too much leeway. I always thought that he wanted to do like a darker film and they like cut it for like for forever. There's like that. They they call it the Schumacher cut now, but I think like back in the day they called it like the Red Journal version or something like that or Red Diary or something it, along. The- yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that originally it was intended to be darker and it was brightened up to a degree. It, it obviously wasn't as dark as Batman Returns, but I think that the intent was to have, like, I, I, you look at other projects that Joel Schumacher did, it's not like he does comedies or camp or anything like that. Like, that's not what he's he, he's known for. He's, all, you know, a lot of his stuff is very cerebral and thriller and thing like, you know, thrillers and things like that. And that's not what, Batman Forever really ended up being, but I think a lot of it had to do with the fact of who they cast for some of the roles. Like, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, you're bringing a character who's known to be very funny, very over-the-top comedic, and things like that, and you're expecting them to do something... Like, he got hired because that's what they wanted. He was there to lighten it up, and whether or not Joel Schumacher, that was his intent to have... You know, a comedian in the role of the Riddler, or whether that was the studio, I guess is a conversation for a different time. But I think that it just comes down to Schumacher had some sort of vision because I remember like there's the whole thing with the giant bat, and that kept was supposed to be like a reoccurring thing, and it was really supposed to focus on like the 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 nature of of the trauma that he dealt with as a child and things like that and you don't really i mean you see some of it the whole inclusion of chase meridian is there to you know dive into that more but she just comes off as you know a love interest and that's the extent of what she's there for because of how everything just ended up being written yeah it's crazy um like uh the studio like they greenlit like a fifth 
Batman movie, a third Schumacher movie, just from looking at the dailies of Batman and Robin. It was like, what scenes were they showing these executives that, like, <laughs> this movie greenlit, like, off the jump? But, yeah, it's, he just went too far with Batman and Robin, and then there was no coming back from it. Batman was dead for eight years after that. Producer walks away from the dailies, like, suit me up, Uncle Alfred. All right, yeah, I like they, that. Yeah, they're like, oh, let's, let's get this third movie out soon. <laughs> but, um... But yeah, the, overall, I mean, I, I didn't say this earlier when you guys said it, but yeah, I am I am against the bat nipples as well. Um, I was like, I don't, I don't think very many people are for the bat nipples, um, outside of maybe the costume designer and Joel Schumacher. But and it is part of Batman history, unfortunately. Um, whether you like it or not, it is part of the the reality of it. So. With that, that is going to wrap up this episode. Um, I want to encourage everybody to check out our website, thebatmanverse.net. We have all kinds of news and original content and tons of reviews related to movies, TV, merchandise, video games, comics, and everything else related to the Bat fandom. Um, we also have a number of other podcasts that you can check out. Um, and you can find those over on our site different ones focusing on specific characters and different other aspects within the Batman universe. Uh, so check those out. You can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We are on Discord. We have a YouTube. Um, and then obviously you can find all of those links to our social channels over on our website at the top of the page. If you are interested in supporting us, uh, we do have Patreon. If you do support us on Patreon at a specific level, you do get early unedited editions of the TBU podcast. Um, and then there's also a tier that will allow you to have unedited early cuts of the TBU comic podcast as well. So you can uh, take a look at that. There's a section under the website called Support TBU. You'll find all the details about that and a bunch of other ways you can support us Um in general. Um, and I will say one final thing as far as support goes, if you're interested in, uh, sharing content with us, um, whether it be you have a YouTube channel, uh, whether it be you are a writer and you want to write about comics or review comics or write about some of the TV shows that release new episodes and things like that. We're always looking for people to come in and join the TBU staff. But even if you're not interested in joining our staff necessarily, but you have an interest in Batman and you have, you're a content creator in some way, shape or form. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to us because um, if you listen to our last episode, that literally just came from uh, Pat sending us an email and saying, Hey, uh, you know, are you guys interested in talking about Batman? And that's how that stemmed. So we're always interested in stuff like that because there are all kinds of different areas and facets of the bat fandom that we'd like to cover that I might not think about, or we might not think about collectively, but somebody else could bring it to us and say, Hey, check this out. So be sure to let us know. You can email us at TBU at the Batman uh, with any of your ideas. Those are always awesome. And we look forward to seeing some new ideas come across very soon. Outside of that, that is everything for this episode. Um, Thank you so much for listening to this latest episode. Uh, It kind of went over my head, but we are on episode 202 this time around, which means uh, we surpassed 200, which is a pretty big milestone um, for a show that literally was on a hiatus for like five years and has been around since way back in 2008. So, Uh, Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and coming back to us as we try to bring you a lot of really cool content related to Batman. So thank you for that. So with that, uh, for BJ, Scott, and myself, uh, we will talk to you guys and see you guys next time. 